Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. I am joined, as always, by my friend, my colleague and co-host of many years, Dan Rubenstein. Don't forget to subscribe at iTunes.com slash Solid Verbal and find us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, of course, on Snapchat. Dan, how are you? I'm good. We can also add drinking pals yeah. to that, that list. I mean, we we haven't done it in a long time, but after the Peisman Trophy, during the Peisman Trophy, I think drinking pals would be an appropriate bullet point to add to our, our collective resume. Got a little loose there afterwards. <laughs> gotta, gotta be honest with you. Travis Haney's a bad influence on me, personally. Is he? Yeah, he likes drinking that heavy porter type beer, which doesn't mm. really work well with my stomach. Sure. But, um, you know, held my own. I don't know. How'd you feel yesterday? Not great, Ty. No? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. As a non-drinker or somebody who drinks like one drink every five or six weeks, I think I had four Friday night at the yeah. Peisman. Um, it was a really good time. Had all sorts of fun people there. So happy that Brian O'Neill from Pitt was able to take it home. Would have been happy with all three of the candidates, Vincent Taylor or Colton Cook. Uh, taking home the hardware, the pieware. Yeah. Um, so that was an incredible event. So many friends of SB Nation and the Solid Verbal were there. E- everything was first class. Loved it. Ate myself sick. Drank myself. Not quite sick. Um, but I, th- I had four. And that's a lot for for old Aunt Dan. <laughs> four for you. Then we did the pizza thing afterwards. Yeah, we went and got pizza with our pal Bill Barnwell and talked to Emo some more. Talk, talk some more Emo. Uh, but yeah, it was a great time. Got to meet some some new people I had never met before. Chris Brown from Smart Football was there. Talked to him mm-hmm. for a bit. Uh, Chip Patterson I met for the first time. Yeah, I would I would vote for Chip for president. Oh, Chip yeah. has like a gravitas when he walks in a room. There's just a warmth there. Great to meet him and and some others who I'm sure I'm I'm forgetting. And uh, yeah, so thank you again for the invite. Yeah, and last night was the I guess the second class college football award, the Heisman, if you will. Yeah, I don't even. I know Lamar Jackson won it. I honestly couldn't tell you the order of voting. Do you have that in front of you? I, I have it in front of me. It was I thought a little closer than I expected. Lamar Jackson came in first with twenty one hundred and forty four points. Deshaun Watson bubbled up. He came in second. He had fifteen twenty four. So a sizable margin. Yeah. For sure, between Lamar Jackson and Deshaun Watson, but uh, still, I thought a little bit closer than I expected. Baker Mayfield came in third. Okay. Uh, Dee Westbrook came in fourth, and then Jabril Peppers finished in fifth place. So, you know, yeah. there was a pretty big gap between two and three. It was pretty apparent that voters favored Lamar Jackson and Watson above above the other three who were in New York. Fair enough. Like, it's hard for me at this point in 2016 to get upset over the Heisman Trophy. It's by nature so arbitrary. So how do you get upset about the finalists or whoever wins it based on uh, qualifications that are sort of unclear? So at this point, it's just sort of like, this guy's the most fun. And what makes him the most fun? Well, I mean, everybody has different definitions of fun. Who's to say? So. The reason the reason that I watch it is not because, again, I'm not going to go back through the diatribe about how I feel about individual awards. The right. reason that I watch, though, is just to see how they handle the broadcast. And mm-hmm. for me, it almost felt, and this is going to sound crazy, I know, it almost felt like they were trying to make the Heisman feel a little less pretentious. Like, you know, we, okay. we did this Piesman thing on Friday night, and it was clear that it was not taking itself too seriously. Right. The Heisman, it almost felt as if they tried to do a little bit of that with the broadcast. And to me, it just felt disorganized compared to what I'm used to. That just, it, it didn't quite pair up. But nonetheless, a, a great ceremony. Congratulations to Lamar Jackson, who incorporated every fashion element in his attire. But I thought he looked great. I thought he pulled it off, too. He really did. The solid wife said the exact same, man. He can pull that off. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a great story. A great story. Congratulations to him and Louisville fans everywhere. It was, a, it was a remarkable season. Yeah, that's the cool thing, is that a fan base gets to celebrate something fun on a national stage. So even though I find the Heisman to be arbitrary and not super exciting, it, it is cool for Louisville fans and obviously for Lamar Jackson. So it's a happy, good thing in college football. Hooray. A happy, good thing. Hooray. Okay. 
Uh, the other, I guess, heartwarming story, if you want yes. to call it that, from Saturday was that Army beat Navy. Army beat Navy after 14 straight losses. Does that sound right? 14 straight losses. They won the game 21-17. Our trusted operative, Taylor Schwink, was down there. Yeah. And we got some great reviews on what he put together on Snapchat. I can't wait to hear what he does in audio form, which we'll play back on our Wednesday show. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just seems like a really cool experience to go down there. The tailgating scene was vibrant. And, uh, you know, clearly Army capitalizes on this moment. It was a good year for Army. They're bowl bound for the first time in forever to now beat their, I don't want to call them hated rival, but clearly their rival Navy. This is a pretty big way to cap a season. I am. I'm happy to see it. It's good that that's a, there's a back and forth with that game and Navy, even though they came in with a good amount of momentum. Listen, Ty, you know what you got to do in these big rivalry games. We've told you. I was going to say, you week gotta, out. You got to throw them right out, baby. <laughs> got to throw them out. Um, we got a little bit of breaking news these past few days. We had breaking news. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, it looks like Charlie Strong is going to be the next USF coach. Yeah, good move. Good hire. Very strong hire. Str- oh, look at uh, you. Um, yes, he is going to recruit well. He is going to do a lot of what Willie Taggart did in sort of getting every single kid who might be borderline USF, UCF in state who, you know, maybe not getting the Miami, Florida, Florida state offers, but is certainly of that caliber like Willie Taggart did at USF. I imagine he will improve that defense dramatically after it took that one year dip without Tom Allen when he went to Indiana. I imagine he will continue to delegate offensively like he was able to do with some success at Texas and he will continue momentum there in Tampa. So I think I think it's a very smart hire, unfortunately, for USF. I imagine if he succeeds, he probably won't be there for a terrible long time, but that's okay. Keep succeeding at USF. Keep succeeding at USF. It's clearly a part of the country he's very familiar with, and Mm -hmm. I think that will play to his favor. So it was a good move for them. I also saw that, um, speaking of geographical sense, Yes. Cincinnati hired Luke Fickle. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that makes good sense. Uh, he obviously had the year of interim head coaching when Jim Tressel left unexpectedly, we'll call it. Um, but he's been in a, at Ohio State for some time now, is familiar geographically with the region. Cincinnati took a huge step back this past year on both sides of the ball. So if nothing else, Luke Fickle will recruit talent to Cincinnati and will get them competitive, I hope, because I like a fun Cincy, uh, sooner rather than later. Because they're a team, not unlike Houston, that is near talent and can be dangerous to teams that perhaps have even more talent. So um, rooting for Luke Fickle after uh, after a rocky time for a little bit in Columbus. So should be fun to see Cincy improve. Yeah, they called him the best fit for the position. And I feel good for him. I really do. Yeah. He seems like an incredibly loyal guy who is just waiting for the right opportunity to come around. And he's a, an assistant coach that is widely respected for the work he's mm-hmm. done. The interim year was tough. It was tough. He might not have been ready for that on the stage like Ohio oh, State. Yeah. But I think he probably learned a lot from it. And Cincinnati's getting a good guy. So good for them. It's a nice hire. I like it. Also, Major Applewhite at Houston. Yeah. So originally, it sounded like it was going to be Lane Kiffin. There was a report out on like Friday, I think, later last week, whenever it was, that it looked like Lane Kiffin was going to get that job. And then it sounds as if things broke down. They ultimately Mm -hmm. go to Major Applewhite instead. Yeah. So Major Applewhite, because of pending and ongoing litigation, was almost certainly not going to go with Tom Herman to Texas because of his own time at Texas as it relates to litigation. Um, but Major Applewhite, somebody who I think has improved his stock over the years. I know Alabama fans weren't huge fans of his when he was their offensive coordinator in 2007, but that was a very different looking Alabama team early on in Saban's tenure. And uh, it seemed that Lane Kiffin didn't have quite the support that Major Applewhite had, especially since uh, Applewhite has the recruiting connections in East Texas and Texas and that it, it feels like a momentum play, which isn't always the best move. You just got to find the best person and assume that they can generate momentum. But here we are. And Major Applewhite was, I, I would imagine, a large part of Greg Ward's success at quarterback. So 
that was sort of the thinking behind Mark Helfrich and the Oregon job, that continuity for Marcus Mariota, and it worked in the short term and not necessarily the long term. I hope it goes differently for Major Applewhite and Houston. I have to believe this is all trending in a direction where Lane Kiffin ends up at LSU or back at Bama. I don't think Lane Kiffin's back at Bama. No? No. I, I think that's done. And it appears that even Sark, who a lot of people thought was the backup plan, that he may be done in Bama as well. Um, I'm not sure what Bama does at offensive coordinator if and when Lane Kiffin leaves. And the NFL could be an option for Lane Kiffin as an offensive coordinator. I saw our pal Travis Haney, who you mentioned is a bad influence, yeah. but a good college football information influence. Great he influence, thinks, yeah. Great influence in terms of information. Yes, he thinks, you know, it's just that that marriage has run its course. Okay. Um, Lane Kiffin, Nick Saban in Alabama. So um, it will be interesting to see where he ends up. And it'll be interesting to see where Alabama goes at offensive coordinator. If I would imagine Mark Helfrich may be in the mix at LSU, if that doesn't work out for for any of the former USC guys, um, maybe Mark Helfrich to Bama. I don't. Oh, man, that would be a <laughs> weird marriage. It would be a huge win for for Alabama, especially with a, yeah. with a dual threat quarterback like Jalen Hurts. Yes, Mark Helfrich has had success with that formula before, hasn't he? He has, and I think, and Helfrich is somebody who I've always liked as a human and who I've always liked as a focus. Like, he didn't run the, uh, he co-ran the offense with Chip Kelly at Oregon, and he is considered to be by everybody that's come across him just like a, like an, an extremely intelligent, smart football mind. And at Alabama, where he's not going to be required to run the day-to-day, and he's not going to be required to recruit with the same level of intensity as a head coach somewhere so far away from recruits as he was at Oregon, that would be he'll be a huge win for whoever he ends up with. Interesting. And I think this all means that Les Miles ends up with ESPN. Uh, that's what it appears. Yeah, he apparently... The, the Houston interview didn't go super well, and... That's good for us. I like hearing Les Miles speak. He's fun. He'd be terrific in any capacity on ESPN. Yeah, ESPN, even if he ends up at Fox Sports, which is certainly more Southwest and West Coast oriented, it'd be whoever gets him. It'd be a great, great job. The only other tidbit I have. Yeah. Is on the solid verbal front. Oh, yeah. What else do we got? So we have discussed this Mm -hmm. here and there. We've been wanting to do a live gig up in New York City for a while now. And mm-hmm. we talked about doing it at some point in December, but as these things go, it it got tough to do in December. We are now working on a postseason postmortem show the weekend following the national championship. So that'd be Correct. January 14th. We are close to nailing down some sort of venue. Dan, is that yes. is that accurate information? It's a great venue. Um there's food there, good food there, um, college football related food there where we haven't signed anything. We haven't agreed with anything yet, but the conversations are very good. Uh, January 14th, New York City in sort of downtown Midtown. It's it's sort of Midtown ish, so it should be pretty central for everybody in the general vicinity or anybody coming from outside of the city. Um, extremely limited in the way of seating, like probably it's, it's sort of like a. I don't know if it's a live show as much as a sort of live powwow. So like yeah. 40 or 50 people somewhere in there. So when we'll, as soon as we nail down the, uh, the details, we will let you know, I would grab a ticket or two and how we figure out how to do that is TBD. I would grab it as, as probably quickly as possible. Cause we're, we're not renting out radio city. Basically. No, no, not like the verbies last year, right? No, not like the Verbies last year. That was, I mean, everybody came around for that. That was wonderful. But um, January 14th, New York City, uh, it's going to be very, very fun and with a lot of food. Stay tuned for more on that front. We promise yes. to uh, make that available as soon as we can. I think that does it for news, Dan. I think so. If you're up for it, yes. shall we talk through the first wave of bowl games? We had like four days off. Yes. Four days. Dan, time to help. Picks of the week. All right. So listen, don't forget to join the pick and pool. The links are out there. They're on Facebook and Twitter, as well as solidverbal.com. I have yet to do that, but okay, I will. I promise. Right. We have had some people ask us about the rules of a confidence pool. How does it work? Basically, you're picking straight up winners. So you go through, take a pass, pick who you think is going to win each game. Then you go back and you rank each game from 1 to 42 in terms of how confident you are in the result. 1 is your least confident. 42 
is the game you're most confident in. If you win the game that you put a 42 next to, that means that you get 42 confidence points. You add that to your score. Correct. And so on and so forth. This year, I'm going to deploy a new strategy. East Coast Elliot, who you know, Mm -hmm. was on in the early infancy of this podcast. Wildly unreliable. Just a total wild card (laughs) from top to bottom. (laughs) Yes. I manage a fantasy baseball team with East Coast Elliot. A total wild card, believe me. Mm -hmm. But I love him, and he's better at bowl confidence pools than any human I've ever met. His strategy, I probably shouldn't be giving this out. I should probably charge like 1995 for this kind of advice. Open source. His strategy is to front load your confidence points. The theory is that there's a bigger disparity between teams at the smaller early bowls than at like the later bigger bowls that everybody knows. Okay. And trust me, it sounds kind of crazy, especially when you put pen to paper. But literally every time he's been in a bowl pool like this, he's -hmm. been top 10. And it sort of makes sense. There's a crazy genius to it that feels like it could actually work. Every online system, including the one that we're using over at ESPN, every online system defaults to giving you those early games with a lesser confidence rating. Elliot says, Elliot says, flip the script. Get all your points early. So it's it's I an like interesting that. way to go at it. The caveat, though, is you got to pick the games right. Right. Yeah, you don't pick the games right. Uh, and that's hard in bowl season, as you know. The point spread, you might as well throw them out. Where's my sound? <laughs> throw the point spreads, <laughs> throw the records out. I'm, I'm going to combine Elliot's formula with a little bit of my own special sauce. And I might come in last, but my first consideration now when picking all these bowl games is going to be which team I think is more motivated to be there. Okay. You know, because these are all exhibition games. That sort of goes in line with the gambling theory that, like, learn, like, a ton about a smaller conference. Like, learn a ton about the Mountain West because, you know, perhaps bookmakers aren't as keen and as detailed in following Mountain West football as they are SEC football or ACC and setting lines. So, and there's probably not as much action coming in to sway those lines. Exactly. I like that. So I want to know which team is actually there because they want to be there and which team wants to win the game. Okay. Now you got to consider which, which team was better all season. And if there are any mm-hmm. matchups and, and all that stuff, right? That, that sort of goes without saying, but I'm going to weigh motivation a little heavier this year. I'm just like going to see what happens. Um, so, okay, let's start at the top. If you go through our bowl confidence pool, the first game that they list is actually the Grambling State North Carolina Central Eagles game in the Celebration <laughs> Bowl. I'm not going to pretend to know a whole lot about this, mm-hmm. but ESPN does include it, and they ought to assign it with a one because it's first. Most people aren't going to change it. I'm saying go 42. Go 42. <laughs> I'm serious. Grambling's a historic program. Yeah. They're favored by 15 and a half points. They're mm-hmm. probably going to win. So what if you don't know a whole lot about it? I'm not so much going to handicap this thing as if I want to get every game right. I'm trying to help people out there who might be in other bowl confidence pools, even our own bowl pool. I want okay. you to win. So I'm saying go Grambly, go 42 points, get them early. Get it on, get it off the board. Bold. Roll the dice. Okay. All right. You you on board with that? I'm totally on board. I like, I like your bold thinking, Ty. I always have. All right. So then that brings us to the Gilded New Mexico Bowl. They make a mean t-shirt, Dan. Yes, and speaking of which, and I, I know you don't have this on our document, but I have it in front of me. I've got bowl gifts. Oh, cool. I've got all the bowl gifts, and we will for each game that we preview, we will also preview the gifts. Okay, so Gilda New Mexico Bowl, Albuquerque, New Mexico, University Stadium. Mm-hmm. This one is on Saturday, 12-17, so next Saturday at 2 p.m. on ESPN, as most of the games are. New Mexico, they're 8-4. and four. They're a 7-point favorite here over UTSA, University of Texas, San Antonio. UTSA went 6-6. Six and six. It's their first ever bowl game, which is notable. What are the gifts? What are these guys getting? Uh, at the New Mexico Bowl this year, there is a gift suite, Oakley sunglasses, an Enduro 25 backpack, Bluetooth earbuds, a beanie, a Gildan stadium blanket, a cap, and a selfie stick. So, a selfie stick? Bad? Not not much you can re-gift, um, but sunglasses, a backpack, and Bluetooth earbuds, you're walking away from this with utilities for your life. Living in New York City, what's the over-under on any given day for how many selfie sticks you see out in the wild? 
Oh, especially because our office is not terribly far from Times Square. Uh, I'll probably see three to four a day. All right. Well, the first factor for me here, I think, is that it's a home game for New Mexico. <laughs> like, Literally a home game at their home stadium. They could sleep in their own beds and play in front of their own fans. And um, hey, ask Wyoming what it's like to play in Albuquerque. You don't want to play in sure. Albuquerque. It's like the house of pain. It's at altitude. For me, that outweighs the fact that this is the first bowl game in the history of UTSA's young football program. A home game in any capacity in bowl season, I think, means a little bit. It just means more. It just means more. The other factor, uh, the game, the, the matchup factor, I think the best singular entity in this game is the New Mexico rushing attack. Yeah. They're averaging like 361 a game, which I double-checked. I believe that's right. That's a lot. That's many. UTSA, they're respectable against the run, but this is a different breed. This is a different breed. New Mexico had three backs with about the same number of carries. Tyrone Owens, Terry and Gibson, Richard McCorley combined that crew rush for about 2,800 yards and 35 touchdowns. So they're pretty damn good. They're pretty damn good. That's what UTSA is going to be up against. If UTSA wants to win, they got to be better throwing the football. I, I just don't think they're going to have enough to get it done here. Home game, New Mexico. I like New Mexico to win this one. I don't know about the point spread, but I got 41 points on this, Dan. <laughs> I'm going heavy it. New Mexico, 31-21. So New Mexico did something this year, and it sort of might be you know swept under the rug, but they did something spectacular and rare this year, and they lost to Rutgers. <laughs> <laughs> New Mexico lost to Rutgers. Uh, they beat Air Force in Wyoming. So there's something about this New Mexico team, and you're right. Their, their rushing offense is great. Uh, they're a top 15 team in my Danalytics. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Danalytics, tie. Uh, touchdowns per play against conference teams. Though they're top 15 in the country in that and dead last defensively in that. So they're sort of kill or be killed. They have an awful pass defense. Uh, and yes, you're right. UTSA is one of the most improved teams. Frank Wilson, his first year was really, really good. Uh, all things considered, they improved offensively. Ways to go defensively. Um, but they were very good in the red zone. So if they can stop New Mexico there and force some field goals, they will keep it relatively close. I thematically, I, I like New Mexico. And since we're straight up in the bull confidence pool, I'm going to go with New Mexico. But I'm going to I'm going to gobble those points up. 34 to 30 New Mexico. Uh, UTSA keeps it close. They sort of deaden Texas A&M a few weeks ago. I'm going with New Mexico close. By Saturday at six, Dan, all I'm saying is I could have 83 confidence points. Okay. Locked and loaded, just kind of me sitting on them, keeping them warm. Mm -hmm. I'm going 42 on Grambling, 41 on New Mexico. Bob Davey. I'll go high. All right. Uh, Las Vegas Bowl, also next Saturday. This one at 3.30 on ABC. This is a good game. It is. This is a good game. We got Houston at 9-3, and three, San Diego State at 10-3. and three. Houston's a three-and-a-half point favorite. You might remember this one last year was a rematch of the Holy War. BYU won that one by seven. Um, I tried to analyze this using my new formula of factoring in motivation. Right. I got to believe that Houston's in big time letdown mode here. No, I have been thinking the same thing. And Houston's season is sort of deceptive. Beating Oklahoma, you know, using turnovers and doing and taking advantage of opportunities, uh, just completely shutting down Louisville and losing to Navy, losing to Memphis, losing to SMU. Houston finished, I believe, tied for third in the American West. So their season was not as dominant as Tom Herman's stock was through the roof. And that's fine. There are all sorts of factors here. And San Diego State won the Mountain West. Um, defensively, they were very, very good for a good chunk of the season. They have one of the best running backs in the country in Donnell Pumphrey, one of the best pass defenses in the country. Um, I think they'll be a little bit more motivated to really good defenses here. Um, I think Houston wants the season to be done with and move on to the major Apple White era. Um, I'm going San Diego State. I'm going to take those points because that's my theme. I'm taking those bowl points. 27-23 yeah, yeah. Aztecs. I've got 28-24 Aztecs. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned all the right things about Houston. This game to me feels like a huge consolation prize if you're them because they were a fringe playoff team back in August. Mm -hmm. And 9-3 and three is clearly short of what they were hoping for. You also lose your coach. You might have heard about that here and there. 
Um, and some assistance already, yeah. And some assistance. That's just a big kick in the pants if you're a Houston player. There's a chance Todd Orlando is trying to, um, you know, <laughs> make some bones for himself elsewhere right. in uh, putting forth a good effort in this game. But I just feel like their heart's not going to be in this. I like Donnell Pumphrey a lot. They're not great at throwing the ball, so they got to get him moving. And mm-hmm. that might not be easy against a really tough Houston front. Excellent. I feel like San Diego State's got more to play for here. I am not confident in this result. So contrary to what I was saying about getting your points early, yeah, get them early, but don't be stupid. I'm going to go um, San Diego State here 28-24, but I'm only going to say three confidence points in this game. They are both playing for a gift suite, an Oakley backpack, a beanie, and a cap. So the New Mexico Bowl showing out a little bit better than the Las Vegas Bowl early. Interesting. Yeah. The caveat there is that you get to go to Vegas versus Albuquerque, New Mexico. You get to go to Vegas, which mixed opinion for me. But we're (laughs) going to get to that in the things that are garbage that people like too much bracket that we're doing. It's a long off season. Yes, it is. We will get to it. All right. Raycom Media Camellia Bowl. Oh, yes. Who doesn't remember their first Camellia Bowl? Camellia Bowl. (laughs) Oh, my God. Watched it with my pappy and my grandpappy. Yeah, it's at the Crampton Bowl in Montgomery, Alabama. Again, next Saturday, the 17th of December on ESPN, 530 Eastern. Toledo at 9-3, a one-point favorite over App State. Dan, they're also 9-3. I distinctly remember our week one recap show when we go Mm -hmm. back over that Tennessee App State game. and App State should have won that game, Ty, and you know it. Tennessee won 20-13. They looked like garbage. And at the time, we didn't know it was going to be a sign of things to come. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking that the big takeaway from that game had to be how lousy Tennessee looked. How lousy and just... Ugh, they looked in that game. And then you started talking on the recap show. And it's like full throttle App State. Like App State's good. They could win the national championship. Really <laughs> caught me off guard. Uh huh. The takeaway now is, yes, App State is pretty good. Maybe not as good, good. as you made them out to be. But their three losses this year were to Tennessee, Miami, and Troy. For the most part, no one else came close to beating them. Akron fought them for like four quarters. But it was, it was one of those catch-up games. The challenge in this game is going to be Toledo quarterback Logan Woodside. Mm -hmm. He is the official quarterback of the solid verbal, as you've noted on Twitter. Oh, yeah. His stats are insane. Mm -hmm. 3,800 passing yards to go along with 43 touchdown passes. The point spread here is one, Dan. Kind of a pick who you got? Uh, I'm going with App State, and I'm going with App State. I'm taking those points, and I have them outright. Um, Toledo does, as you mentioned, the official quarterback of the solid verbal, Logan Woodside. The Toledo, the Rockets have a top 30 offense. I would somewhere around there in the country, top 30, 35. Their defense is a little bit average. App State, number one, Ty, the number one defense in the Danalytics. <laughs> Touchdowns allowed per play against conference teams. 1. What does that 6- mean? What does that stat mean? It's the It's the number of touchdowns they allow per play. So I judge a defense by how many touchdowns they allow and how many plays, and they don't allow touchdowns, Ty. And it's it's very good. So the Danalytics are conclusive on this then? The Danalytics are conclusive. This is against conference teams. So for App State, this is against Sunbelt teams, which is a different animal, but you saw them perform pretty well against Tennessee and not the greatest against Miami, but whatever. Um, they've allowed three touchdown passes, App State, since October 1st. Wow. Six of the last eight teams they've played, they've held quarterbacks under five yards per attempt. So I really like the matchup just in general, the push and pull of Logan Woodside against this defense. I'm going to go with the defense as the most extreme good thing here. Toledo doesn't generate enough turnovers and they're playing against a tricky App State offense. I'm going with App State. I'm going with my boys from Boone, 28-24. 28-24. I like the boys from Boone. I like that, by the way. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. 35-28. I'm not nearly as confident in this because it is a, a pretty even matchup, at least on paper. So I'll go 10 confidence points. But to your point about App State's defense, the pass defense is pretty good. According to Bill's, uh, Bill Connolly's S&P Plus, 14th in the country against the pass, yeah. which is a lot better than most people would ever care to know. And on the whole, I'd say, if you look at how they've played defensively throughout the course of the year, defense is just a lot more consistent. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not... It's not bottoming out in spots like we saw with Toledo. So, like I said, not crazy confident, but I do like App State outright. The alma mater of Dan Rubenstein, App State. <laughs> uh, 10, points, playing, but- 10 points, 35-28. Let's go App State. 
They're playing for access to a gift suite. I mean, they're both getting this um, gift suite fossil watch, which I respect the hell out of a watch. You know, that's it's you can use it for years and years. It serves a purpose. A coin. Don't know what coin. I'm assuming a commemorative one, but maybe they're just handing them all sackage away as I don't know. <laughs> um, a hat, a beanie, a duffel bag made by your friend and mine. Oh, Gio. Yeah. Um, and a big game autograph football. So thanks for that, Camellia Bowl. Speaking of watches, Dan. Yeah. Uh, holiday shopping can be tough. Oh, yeah, it can. But thanks to MVMT watches, that gift giving anxiety can disappear. Mm-hmm. With the press of a button. These watches, they make the perfect purchase in just about any situation in life, any holiday, any gift-giving occasion. Dan, remember, they only start at 95 bucks. We've talked about our MVMT watches. Did you have yours on during the Piesman? At, at the Piesman, absolutely I did. I thought I saw it. Oh, yeah. You had it. Again, they start at 95 bucks. You go to a department store, I mean, four or 500 bones for one of these guys. Movement figured out that by selling online, they can cut out the middleman. They can cut down the retail price and give you a really cool watch with the classic design and quality construction, styled minimalism, as they call it. They sold over 500,000 of these in over 160 countries to date. Check them out right now. Go to MVMTWatches.com slash solid. You can get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns. So if you buy it for somebody, even for yourself, you decide you don't like it, send it back free returns. It's a pretty good deal. Again, it's a clean design. We have gotten compliments ever since we started putting them on. Now is the time to step up your watch game. Go to mvmtwatches.com slash solid and join the movement. (laughs) All right. Uh, the Auto Nation Cure Bowl. Yeah. Robert Smith will be singing the national anthem. Really? Um, the, of The Cure. Of the oh, brand, the, cure. the band The Cure. Sorry. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Next Saturday, 530, CBS Sports Network. So it could be a crazy game. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's in Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida. It is UCF at 6-6, six and six, a six-point favorite. Over the Arkansas State Red Wolves at seven and five. Two big things here that jump out at me. First and foremost, another home game situation. UCF plays their home games like on the other side of Orlando, which means they can sleep in their own beds. They can move mm-hmm. more at their own pace. They can play in front of their own fans. Nice little, nice little prize here, I think, for the UCF following because there is a UCF following. They're very, oh, sure. very fervent, and I think this is a nice prize for them. Especially given the fact that UCF was 0-12 last year. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other factor here. Talk about a turnaround. Talk mm-hmm. about it just meaning more. How much does this game mean to them, especially at home, Dan? It just means more time. It just means more. They've also got your boy, Scott Frost. They do. UCF. So even, even with Scott Frost, who obviously comes in with offensive experience, putting up some big numbers at Oregon these past few years. The uh, the Knights are led by their defense. Um, they are, I mean, it's kind of easy to argue that they're the most improved defense in the country because they went from being atrocious in 2015 to pretty good, like top 30, 35 defense in the country in 2016. Um, they're decent against the run. They're very impressive against the pass. And Ty, let's, let's create a space right now. What do you know about Shaquem Griffin and how much he's getting to the quarterback, Ty? You tell me. <laughs> Break down Shaquem Griffin's game because he's, I think, top 10 in the nation in sacks He's pretty at this damn point. good. He's good. He's very good. Um, the Red Wolves of Arkansas State, they start out 0-4. They finish 7-1, and a completely lights-out defense. So two good defenses in here. Um, they're up there with App State in the Danalytics tie. 1.99% of all plays are touchdowns, which is pretty efficient. That is pretty efficient. Um and they throw the ball relatively well because US, UCF, excuse me, struggles the ball, struggles on offense to move the ball. I'm actually going, even though it's on the road, even though it's in Orlando, I'm going Arkansas State outright, Whoa. 23 to 20. Red Wolves. Whoa. Yeah. Um, if you look at the S P report for UCF, mm-hmm. it's sort of beyond rational comprehension how UCF <laughs> scores at all. Yeah. Like, give it a good look. Give, give it a good look. And 
try to come away from that little study session figuring out how UCF is scoring their points. Just in general. Rough. There's there's like no tendency there. It doesn't seem like there are enough points on the stat sheet to indicate a 6-6 six and six team. But nonetheless, okay, we're here. I am rolling the dice on your boy, Scott Frost, Dan. Wow, my boy. I am rolling the dice, and I'm going to sweat this one out to the tune of 35 confidence points. Okay. Home game, you know my strategy. I'm in it to win it this year. 35 points, I think they I like win this one you're, outright. You're just abandoning your theory of going against your gut, though. It's a new me. It's a new you. Um, speaking of new things, sports watch, warm-up jacket and pants, portable charger, which you know what? I love that's, that. That's being that might be the best gift yet. I love that. Dry fit, long sleeve shirt, and a backpack. I like a sports watch, a dry fit shirt, a portable charger, and a backpack. You're not coming away from the uh, from the Cure Bowl empty-handed. I'm, I'm with it. If you've got anything like more than two versions back of the iPhone, you need a portable mm-hmm. charger. Absolutely. If you're listening you to this, like you've definitely thought to yourself, where is the portable charger I bought two years ago? Because I need it. My battery's dead. I would, I would go as far as saying... Get somebody like the best portable charger, like one of those that's the size of a flask. Yeah, yeah. And none of these companies sponsor our show. This is just a rec- Get it to somebody for their wedding. They might be going on a honeymoon right after the fact, and it has like four, five, six charges on her. You might remember a gravy boat. You're definitely going to remember how great a charger is in your life. I know what I'm getting you. Yes. All right. Oh. R&L Carriers New Orleans Bowl. Also, mm-hmm. next Saturday. Next Saturday, a busy bowl day. Yep. Not high-profile games, but fun games. I think some fun. of these could be a lot of fun. This is the nightcap. It's in the New Orleans Superdome. 9 p.m. ESPN Southern Miss at 6-6 six and six is a 3.5-point favorite over Louisiana Lafayette, also 6-6. Six and six. Dan, two teams here who actually became bowl eligible in their final games. Mm-hmm. They've played 50 times in their history, Southern Miss Leads the series. They've won the last eight here. Southern Miss, I feel, is a really good play, and here's why. Okay. They would have had a better record if not for the fact that they lost their quarterback, Nick Mullins, late in the year. He got injured against Charlotte. He was unable to play the next two games. Right there, that's three of your six losses. And then another loss came when he got injured earlier in the season against UTSA. We talked about UTSA before. Listen to the blurb here. I'm from ready. the Sun Herald, it's a newspaper in Southern Mississippi, talking about how tough their quarterback Nick Mullins was in that game against UTSA. All right, you ready for this? I want you mm-hmm. to sit down. After Mullins jogged over to the sideline, favoring his right hand, Jay Hobson, their coach, wandered over to check on him. "Quote: He had a bone sticking through his thumb," Hobson oh. said with a look of disbelief. "I remember I saw the bone pop out, and he said." Uh, just push the bone back in and tape it up. I think I can throw the ball. Wow. Nick Mullins for president, man. Jeez. Yeah. Talk about a bowler. He's going to be in this game, unless I miss something, unless he's hurt again. I'm going to go Southern Miss. I'm going to get saucy with it, Dan. Do it. I'm going to live dangerous. Tweet me if you like to live dangerously. <laughs> Tweet or me you if need you- to know what time it is. Tweet me if you're with me and going 36 points on Southern Miss to win this wow. one outright. I'm actually pretty confident as well. And you're right about Nick Mullins. Super tough. Their offense has been pretty decent, especially uh, through the air. Southern Miss defense has been kind of atrocious. And it's a weird matchup because Louisiana Lafayette, we love Mark Hudspeth, but um, their offense has been atrocious. And the defense, especially against the run, has been good. But that's not a great matchup against Southern Miss. I think the Eagles win comfortably. I have it 34-17. So I'm totally great with your confidence level. Thank you. And it means a lot way, to me. The New Orleans Bowl, kind of a disappointing gift bowl. Yeah. I know. I, I wish it were better. Maybe they're going to eat really, really well, and that'll make up for it. Gift Suite and Fossil Watch. That's all I'm seeing here. Come on, r carriers. Dan, New Orleans versus Las Vegas. Oh, New Orleans. It's not New Orleans, by the way, Ty. It's, I, I know. It's New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. Um, New Orleans is another world ahead. I would agree with that. There's culture. Not that there's not culture in Vegas, but there's fun culture, um, more authentic culture, and the food is... You you don't have to spend a ton of money in New Orleans to have great food. I I think it's way, way better. All right. Moving on to Monday now. Yes. Monday. So, 
Saturday, you get your fill of, I don't know how many bowl games that was, five games maybe. Mm -hmm. Sunday's off. It's for the NFL. So do something else. And then come back Monday afternoon, 2.30 on ESPN. Let's go to Miami, Miami Beach Bowl. Miami, Florida, Marlins Park. Mm -hmm. Tulsa is sitting there, an 11-point favorite at 9-3 and over Central Michigan. Central Michigan is at 6-6. Six and six. Dan, I want you to do something for me. You in front of a I'm computer? Ready. Yes, I am. So I decided to look up Central Michigan on a map. They okay. are not kidding when they say Central Michigan. Pull up Google Maps. Maps.google.com. Okay. Let me know when you it's got that open. Up. Yep, open. I want you to find Michigan. Okay, I know where it is. Now, move your cursor to what you would consider to be the middle of the state, the, the mitten part of the state, not the upper peninsula, but the, the, real, the real mitten part of the state. Put your cursor like where, you think, where you think the, okay. the middle point of the mitten is. Okay. Now, I'm in Isabella Township, Michigan. Now, zoom in, all right? Mm-hmm. That's Mount Pleasant. You see Mount Pleasant on there? Yes, it's right by Isabella Township. Welcome to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, population 26,000, home of the Chippewas. Oh, okay. I was pretty close. I'm saying it's a very literal central Michigan. Oh, good. I thought you were gonna, you had a bone to pick. No, no bones. I'm just saying they were they were very astute and thoughtful in putting central Michigan in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Yeah. I mean, if you're hanging out at Deerfield Nature Park or Union Charter Township, Lake Isabella, obviously very popular yep. with people in Weidman, Nottawa, which, by the way, Rosebush, all sorts of great places around here. Absolutely. Uh, OK, on to football. Yes. You may remember that Central Michigan, quote unquote, beat Oklahoma State in that crazy play, play that probably shouldn't have happened. That's really the nicest thing I can say about them all year. <laughs> other than to not... say, other than to say, I'm sure Mount Pleasant's a very nice town. Mm-hmm. Tulsa is demonstrably better. Yeah, I have Tulsa being they're extremely balanced uh, in that they have a very good offense, pretty decent defense. They have two thousand yard rushers and James Flanders and D'Angelo Brewer. You had a bunch you wanted to say about those the tandem, right? Yeah, of course. James Flanders and D'Angelo Brewer. Uh, Dane Evans is decent. Uh, Philip Montgomery has been a growing name at head coach. You know, perhaps getting a better job after his time at Baylor and now succeeding with Tulsa. And I, you're right. I don't, what does, what do the Chippewas do well? What are they efficient at doing? I don't see it. I'm going with uh, the Golden Hurricane real big here. 38-13. I think they cover it comfortably. 38-13. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go nuts here. I'm going to say Tulsa wins and I'm going to go 40 points. Front okay. loading. We're front loading, wow. Dan. That's what we're doing. I want to have um, I want to have hundreds of points by the end of the weekend. You can front load in your Under Armour backpack. You can load it up with a hat and sunglasses. I slide sandals, portable power bank, which I assume that's something similar to the charger. Yeah. Okay. A beach paddle set and a football. And here's something, even though we can't really find anything terribly good about Central Michigan and we like Tulsa. It's going to be in the 20s or 30s next week in Tulsa. Ooh. It's going to be in the teens yeah. in Mount Pleasant. So always happy that, you know, guys who've worked hard all year gets a reward. They go to Miami Beach. You don't end up in like, listen, we love you, Montgomery, I think. Yeah. But it's it's good to end up in Miami Beach. All right. Two games left here. Let's move quickly. Yes. The Boca Raton Bowl in Boca Raton, Florida. Mm-hmm. They play it at FAU's stadium. Um, Tuesday. This one's 1220, so December 20th at 7 p.m. on ESPN. Western Kentucky, 10 and 3. Mm-hmm. They are four and a half point favorites against Memphis, who is now eight and four. Dan, I am super torn here. Why is that? Um Western Kentucky is legitimately good. Yes. They're legitimately good. They lost to Alabama, Vandy, and Louisiana Tech. But they also just lost their coach. They did. So who knows where their heads are at? They're also going to be led by Nick Holt. Remember Nick, Nick Holt, Nick Holt, Nick Holt. Nick Holt's going to be in charge. Um, yeah. Memphis, I think, is really good. And they should not be taken lightly. Mike Norville took over. You'll remember for Justin Fuente. Food. Just after they lost Paxton Lynch to the NFL. Mm-hmm. And they're still scoring almost 40 a game. They beat Houston to close out the year. This is a good team. And so I'm kind of torn between Western Kentucky being, I think, really good versus them maybe not being fully in it, primarily because they lost Jeff Brom. So Western Kentucky leads the nation in offensive analytics. 
So there's that touchdowns per play and especially impressive considering they had a first year quarterback, Mike White, total stud. Um, Do you know who Mike White's backup is at Western Kentucky? Who's that? He is one of those quarterbacks who has like, I think he may have been enrolled at like four different schools, including Penn State, Tyler Ferguson. Yep. Remember Tyler Ferguson? I did see that. Yep. You're right. Uh, And here's the other thing about Western Kentucky. That's pretty rare. Uh, I think Washington may be the only other team to do this. Western Kentucky, the Hilltoppers are number one on offense and defense and yards per play and yards per play allowed. That's very difficult when you have such a prolific offense and the defense needs to rotate in a bunch of guys. Number one on both sides of the ball in Conference USA. Memphis, as you mentioned, a decent enough offense. I'm sort of underwhelmed by their defense. I have it 37-20 Hilltoppers, even with Nick Holt. Okay. I think a lot of points... Nice. I think a shootout. I am going to stick to my template. I think the game just means more to Mike Norville. Just means more. And Memphis in his first year at coach. I wow. love me the Hilltoppers, but it hurts to lose, lose a coach. Yes, it does. Memphis wins outright 45-42. I am not confident in this, so I shall wager two. You shall wager two. Two points in this, Dan, but I'm going to go Memphis um, outright. I have this as, this is, God dang it, Marmot, Boca Raton Bowl. Gift suite and quote other items. Other items. So what are they getting a bowl of Apple Jacks? I don't understand what okay. that's that's rough. That you, you gotta publicize better than that, Marmot. All right. And then finally, Dan, let's go to the San Diego County Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl. They play this mm-hmm. one in San Diego at Qualcomm Stadium. It's on Wednesday, December 21st at 9 o'clock PM. It's on ESPN. It's BYU at 8 and 4. They're an 8.5 point favorite over eight and five Wyoming. Dan, I'd like to hearken back to 1981, the year of my birth, mind you. Oh, wow. A famous Lavelle Edwards quote after losing to Wyoming in a snowstorm. He said, quote, I'd rather lose and live in Provo than win and live in Laramie, which I do Big believe. Words. I do believe counts as them's being fighting words, Dan. Oh, absolutely. Um, Yeah, BYU's offense, not particularly impressive, but they were in pretty much every game. They finished the season strong against the weaker part of their schedule, Um, but they were tough. They played West Virginia tough. They beat Mississippi State. They beat Michigan State. So this is a a BYU team to be reckoned with, particularly on defense. Wyoming is sort of the opposite. Their offense is really good. Uh, Really like the job Brian Hill did in the backfield for the Cowboys, but defensively, Wyoming has... They have some struggle in them. So... I think I'm going to go with BYU here. I I think I can just count on BYU a little bit more. Wyoming was two up and down, especially in the back half of the season, the big win over Boise State, but then a couple of bad losses after that. Um, I'm I'm going to go with, and the point spread here, it's like eight and a half? Eight and a half, yeah. Eight and a half for BYU. I'm going to take the points. I think it's going to be a bit of a shootout because I'm not a fan of either one of these teams in terms of keeping the other down for a terrible long time. So I'm going to say... 35 33 BYU. So I'm going to take those points. My boy Craig Bull, whose head is shaped like the inside of the Oregon. O. Yeah, it's it's been a nice year for both these teams. It was really easy to lose track of BYU because they mm-hmm. started one and three, lost to Utah and UCLA and West Virginia. But you got to remember, this is an entirely new coaching staff. A lot of first timers, yeah. including the head guy, Kalani Sataki. Mm-hmm. I really think he did a great job. He finished the year after that rough stretch. Finished out 7-1. and one. The one loss was against Boise. And it was a one-pointer. And truthfully, a game they had no business being in because they turned it over like five times. Got wildly outgained. But yep. they fought. And mm-hmm. that's what I like about them. Craig Bull, you mentioned him, had a shot at a 10-win season but dropped the last two to New Mexico and San Diego State. I think BYU should be able to run all over Wyoming. I, I think they should be able to. I'm pretty confident in it. Um, I also think it will be an overwhelmingly pro BYU crowd just because it's closer and because BYU has got a loyal fan base. Yep. Um, I'm reasonably confident, not overly, but reasonably. I think BYU wins. I'm going 32 confidence points on BYU here, Dan. Wow. Okay. And that's all I I got. I should point out. Yeah, that if you're interested in going to any of these games, you should check out SeatGeek. It oh, is yeah. the smartest, easiest way to find tickets for football games and bowl games you want to see up close and in person. The bowl experience 
is raved about by nearly everyone who goes to a bowl game. So check it out. SeatGeek, I'm sure, offers very reasonably priced tickets. All you need to do is download the app on your phone. It's free. What they do is they collect information from a bunch of ticketing locations out there on the web. They're able to go through and grade each ticket. They'll tell you where you get the most bang for your buck. So you know that when you shop, you're getting a lot of value. You can also be confident in your purchase. They offer 100% guarantee, which means that you can shop with 42 confidence points, Dan. I think that's what I'm saying here. Thank you. I like that. Every ticket on the site is graded based on value. So you're going to see anything that's underpriced. You'll be able to find deals, things that fit within your budget if you want to go see a bowl game up close and in person. Right now, a $20 rebate. $20 rebate after your first SeatGeek purchase if you use the promo code SOLID. So here's the way this works. you got to download the free SeatGeek app today. Mm -hmm. Then you go to settings, click add a promo code, and enter our promo code, which is SOLID. S-O-L-I-D. They will send you 20 bucks after you make your first ticket purchase. Again, after you make that purchase, using our promo code SOLID, and using, of course, the free SeatGeek app, SeatGeek, S-E-A-T-G-E-E-K. It's a free app. Download it today. Do it. It's real fun. I've used it and love it. So that's all I got, Dan. That's all I have, I think. Uh, had a great time seeing you. You too. And solid wife, Kate, for, for really the first time socially. I mean, we, we sort of hung at your wedding, but never really had a chance to just really break bread and get to know each other. So it was great. And you got to do the same with the solid fiance. So She's terrific. Yeah. A lot of fun. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, I have a literal and figurative Piesman hangover still. Okay. And uh, I'm about to go get some huevos rancheros right now. Huevos rancheros. Huevos rancheros. All right, Dan. Well, this Fluente. is fun. We're gonna be back. we're gonna be back on Wednesday again. We'll publish a new yes. show. We'll talk about the next wave of bowl games, and um, again, get in on the bowl confidence pool. We've got links everywhere. We've explained how it works. We're gonna continue to break games down in a manner that is somewhat relevant to the bowl confidence pool. Give you some mm-hmm. tips here and there, however we can, uh, and do stay tuned for more information on the live show. If you're going to be January in, 14th in the New York City area. Yeah, we'll we'll post information as it becomes available. An intimate gathering, if you will, of verballers. And we'll do a little postmortem on the 2016-17 season. Food, adult beverages, um, a cool little space, Ty and his radiant energy. Me with my sometimes cool, sometimes not so cool energy. And <laughs> it's going to be a great time. We're going to we're going to do it up. Do it up. All right. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein. For myself, Ty Hildenbrand, thanks again for tuning into the show. Don't forget to subscribe at iTunes.com slash Solid Verbal. Enjoy your week and stay solid. Peace.